All praises due to Allah who has blessed us with this glorious gathering on this glorious day. All praises due to Allah who has blessed us with Iman and blessed us with Islam and blessed us with Ihsan. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Hilladhi hadana lihada. All praises due to Allah who has guided us to this way. Wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. And we would not have been able to guide ourselves had not Allah guided us. We wanted to speak about the ways that we are like Ibrahim alayhi salam because the events of these days are focused around the life, the struggle, the trials of Ibrahim alayhi salam, his wife and his progeny. And we are his spiritual progeny. Millata abikum Ibrahim, the way of your father Abraham. So he's not our physical father, some he might be. But most of us not, not so. But he is our spiritual father, alayhi salam, peace upon him. So the ways we are like Ibrahim and the ways we should strive to be like Ibrahim, alayhi salam. One way we're like Ibrahim is that like Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God has chosen us for this way. Allah Ta'ala says concerning Ibrahim alayhi salam, Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan lillah hanifan wa lam yaku minal mushrikeen shakiran li'an'umi ijtabahu wa hadahu ila siratim mislam mustaqeem. That Ibrahim was a nation unto himself. Devoutly obedient to Allah, naturally inclined towards monotheism. He was not amongst the idolaters. He was deeply appreciative to the blessings Allah bestowed upon him. He, was, he chose him, Allah chose him, ijtabahu, and he guided him to a straight path. وَهَدَاهُ إِلَى سِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ So Ibrahim السلام, was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the great mission that history has recorded him as fulfilling. We should understand that we too were also chosen and when Allah Ta'ala mentions that fact, he mentions it in the context of Ibrahim or Abraham alayhi salam. So Allah Ta'ala tells us, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعْلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ So strive in the way of Allah as should rightfully be the case. وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادٍ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ He has chosen you. وَمَا جَعْلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ Millati abikum Ibrahim, the way of your father Abraham. And in this, there are so many lessons. We will just mention one before returning to the main one. Allah Ta'ala says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Strive in the way of Allah should rightfully be the case. The right that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has over us can never be fulfilled by our striving. Can never be fulfilled by our striving. And therefore Allah Ta'ala enters us into Jannah based on His mercy, not our actions. Based on His mercy, not our actions. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed his companions of this, they said to him, وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Not even you, O Messenger of Allah, not even you will enter Jannah based on your actions. قَالَ وَلَا أَنَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّنِ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ وَفَضْلِهِ Or كَمَا قَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم, He said, not even me. I will only enter if Allah envelops me in his mercy and his grace. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we should understand, but the actions are important. The actions are important. The actions are the key 
to the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our actions are necessary, not sufficient. Sufficiency comes from the mercy and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we strive for. That's what we live for. And that's what we will die upon, inshallah ta'ala, striving to our utmost for the mercy and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that, our actions in and of themselves would never be sufficient. We can never fulfill that right. And here, we derive and benefit from a legal principle. Allah, we know our ulama tell, tell us, al-mashaqqatu tajlib at-taysir, that difficulty calls for ease, for facilitating ease. So the difficulty that is involved in fulfilling the right we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compensated by the ease that Allah gives us in what He has asked of us. So there's a right that we owe to Allah symbolically, but there is a duty we have in fulfilling the obligations He's imposed upon us. And those obligations are bearable. Those obligations are even easy, especially when one's heart is filled with light and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after mentioning the magnitude of our struggle based on the right we owe to Allah, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ Allah reminds us, but He has not made it difficult. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ And He's made no difficulty for you in your religion. So we were chosen and Ibrahim was chosen. And it's important for us to remember that we were chosen because sometimes we forget that fact and we live lives of no purpose. If we understand we were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we were chosen to walk on the path that was laid down by Ibrahim, then immediately our lives take on a sense of purpose and we're not drifting aimlessly through this life being pushed tither to and fro by the forces, the vicissitudes of time and the vagaries of fate. We live lives that are infused with a sense of purpose because we know we're walking in the footsteps of a giant. And whenever one is cognizant of the fact that he or she is walking in the footsteps of giants, he or she will never consciously do anything to disappoint the one who has laid down the path that they are walking upon. Because they realize that path was only laid down through sacrifice, through struggle, through effort, overcoming hardship, challenges, and difficulties. And when we realize that, we don't want to be the one to deviate from that path because it would be an expression of ingratitude to the ones who sacrificed to lay down the path. And the path that we walk upon was first laid down by our forefather, Abraham, alayhi salam, millata abikum, Ibrahim. Brothers and sisters, we were chosen. Some of us are immigrants from other lands. If that's your case, ask yourself, what did you do to get here in the first place? What made you different from your neighbor, from your former schoolmate that you grew up with, from your classmate, from your cousin, your uncle, your brother, your sister, who still wherever you came from, what made you different? Once you attain to these shores, in many instances seeking a better material existence, seeking education, in many instances education for a better material existence. What led you here today? When you know there are five, six, maybe ten like you who came here who are at work right now seeking that better material existence. What brought you here today? What led you to spend your money to establish this center and hundreds of others, if not thousands, throughout this land? What caused you to walk on a different path? What caused you to sacrifice the money you could be spending on your bigger house? The money you could be spending on your faster car? 
the money you could be spending on your better home or garden? What caused you to spend it? See, Sabili left. Was it something you did? Or was it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you for a mission? Who ajtabakum? He has chosen you. You didn't choose yourself. He has chosen you. And when you realize that you've been chosen again, you will undertake the responsibility that you've been chosen for with purpose, with direction, with conviction, with determination, overcoming every obstacle that's placed in your path. And some of us are converts. Some of us have converted to Islam. Again, we ask the question, what made us different than our neighbor, our brother, our sister, who are still living lives with no Islam? Was it something we did? Were we more intelligent? Were we more virtuous? Were we more obedient to our parents than they? Or did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose us? And if he chose us, we should understand he does nothing in vain. He does nothing without a purpose. He does nothing idly. He has chosen us for a mission. He has chosen us for a mission. And that mission is to walk on the path of Ibrahim. That mission is to establish regular prayer. That mission is to pay our charity. That mission is to work, to sacrifice, to see that our people find the comfort in La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah just as we have found the comfort in La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. As we reflect on the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam, there's a powerful lesson for the young people. Many of the people here are young and that's beautiful. That's wonderful. But they're struggling to overcome the mentality that the modern condition bequeaths to individuals. There are young married couples here struggling to keep their marriages together. Struggling mightily to overcome the forces of individualism. Ibrahim alayhi salam to go back to something he did. We mentioned something he represents that we represent, that we share with him. He was chosen, we were chosen. And now we'll mention something, insha'Allah ta'ala, that we should try to be like Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim smashed the idols. He smashed the idols of his people. And they saw the wreckage before them, qalu. مَنْ فَعَلَ هَذَا بِآلِهَتِنَا إِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا فَتَنْ يَذْكُرُهُمْ يُقَالُ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ They said, who has done this to our gods? مَنْ فَعَلَ هَذَا بِآلِهَتِنَا Verily he is a wrongdoer and oppressor. قَالُوا they said, we heard a young man قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا فَتَيْنْ يَذْكُرُهُمْ Conspiring against them. He goes by the name of Abraham. يُقَالُوا لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيم So Ibrahim in his youth, he smashed the idols. And we should also be idol smashers. But as we look around, we don't find the landscape that Ibrahim find, we found. We don't find a landscape littered with idols, with statues of wood and stone and terracotta and clay, people prostrating to those physical idols that they have manufactured with their own hands. We don't find that, perhaps in a far corner of the earth, perhaps in some remote jungle or some remote mountain village somewhere, people are still prostrating to idols, but that's not our dominant condition. But the 20th century and the experiences of that century have bequeathed unto us another idol, the idol of the self, the idol of the ego, the idol of the nafs. And that is the idol we should be about the business of smashing. Because just as people were harmed 
when they prostrated themselves before idols of stone or clay or wood or whatever the case may be. People are harmed when they prostrate before the idol of the self. And we see that harm all around us. The worship of the self is tearing our marriages apart. The worship of the self is tearing our families apart. The husband can't sacrifice for the wife. The wife can't obey the husband. The children can't obey the parents because all of them are prostrating to the idol of the self. We have to smash that idol just as Ibrahim smashed that idol. And if he smashed that idol with a hammer or an axe or a bludgeon of some type or the other, we have to smash that idol with the worship of Allah. We have to smash that idol by committing ourselves to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have to smash that idol by elevating our souls beyond that lowly level, level of the nafsul ammar of to the level of the nafsul mutma'inna. The soul that's contented with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The soul that's pleased with Allah and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the weapon that we have to smash the idol of the self. And when we smash that idol, we will be the beneficiaries of the ensuing peace. We will be the beneficiaries of the ensuing tranquility. We will be the beneficiaries of Tawheed because as long as that idol exists, we can never actualize the true and deeper meanings of divine unity in our lives, in our hearts, in our beings, in our consciousness. And if, if anyone doubts that the self can be an idol, we remind you as Allah Ta'ala has reminded us in the Quran, Have you not seen the one who takes the very inclination of his soul as his God? And when that is the case, Allah Ta'ala sends him astray despite his possession of knowledge. Because that's how dangerous and pernicious and diabolical the worship of the self is. Brothers and sisters, let us smash that idol so that we can be servants of Allah and servants of each other. Because as long as that idol exists, we, want, we will want to be served. Because that God of the self, like every God, demands service. There's only one true God who is rightfully served Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, almighty God, Allah. Young people, look at the life of Ismail, who was young like you. And many of the events we commemorate, the culmination, the sacrifice, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of what transpired. When he says, So as a young person, a young teenager, Ismail السلام, was asked by his parent, by his father, not to give up a girlfriend or a boyfriend, not to give up a pay PS3 or 4 or whatever number the PS is up to, or to give up this or to give up drugs, or to drink, give up alcohol, or to give up this or that dress style, or to give up the purple streak in the hair. Ismail السلام, was asked by his father to give up his life. So we ask our young people, are you any, is any one of your parents asking you to give your life up physically? Ask you to be killed? Ibrahim Ismail السلام, was asked to give up his life. 
And what did he say? Ya Abba tif'al ma tu'mar. Father, do what you've been commanded. I'm not here to make things, make it difficult for you to be a Muslim. I'm not making it difficult for you to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm here to make it easy for you. Young people, when's the last time you said to your parents, I'm here to make it easy for you? Ismail was saying, I'm here to serve you. Young people, when's the last time you told your parents you're here to serve them? Cognizant of the fact that they have served you. They have served you when you were incapable of serving yourself. And that is the meaning of Lamna Balagha Mahusaya. When he reached the age, the ulama say, the child's being a burden and a source of difficulty for the parent is gone. No more diapers to change. No more runny noses to wipe. No more dirty rear ends to clean. He, the child, he or she now can clean themselves. Can cook for themselves. And in former days, 10 or 12, that was the case. As many of you know all too well, who are old enough to remember those days, is old enough to clean for himself and is old enough to start serving their parents after their parents had served them up to that point. And right at that age, when Ibrahim is ready to benefit from his son, he's asked to sacrifice him. But his son says, Father, do what you have to do. You will find me. I will be patient with what Allah Ta'ala has ordered you to do. Young people, it's time for you to tell your parents, I will be patient with what Allah has ordered you to do. I will assist you in undertaking the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I realize, unlike Ismail, you're not asking me to give up my life. You're asking me to give up something that ultimately will undermine my life. If I continue on the path of companionship with these people, if I continue on the path of drugs or alcohol or this or that or the other, this is something that will harm me. And so you're calling me to something that will benefit me and I will be patient in your obedience. This is the society that we strive for. These are the values that we want to perpetuate in the earth, but we can't do it alone. The old people can't do it alone. It takes the young and the old working together with each other. It takes the young and the old. So smash the idol of the self. Sisters, smash the idol of the self where you only have an unending list of demands for your husband. Husband, smash the idol of yourself, where you have these inflated, egotistical demands of your wife. Children, smash the idol. Parents, smash the idol, so that we can go forth and build the kind of society that the prophets السلام, have bequeathed unto us. This is what these days remind us of. They remind us of the prophets. Ibrahim, Ismail, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and their struggles and what they sought to bring into the earth. Brothers and sisters, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. In conclusion, 
that we remind you and remind myself. We go back to the first verse we mentioned. إن إبراهيم كان أمة قانتة لله حنيفا ولم يكن من المشركين. That Ibrahim, Abraham was a nation unto himself, devoutly obedient. He wasn't amongst the idolaters and inclined towards monotheism. He was an ummah. What does this mean? It means three things. First of all. He was a paragon of virtue. He embodied all of the virtues that might exist amongst the members of an ummah. And while we will never attain to the level of Ibrahim salam in terms of our moral character or the level of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those are the heights we should be aiming for. One of the sad and pathetic states of our time is that we've been oriented to look down towards the pits and engage in a race towards the bottom. Who can be the most degenerate? Who can dress the most sloppily? Muslims adopted. You see Muslim with a, a vest on and their shirt tails hanging below the vest when they should be tucked into their pants. But Muslims get involved in that race to the bottom. You hear Muslims losing language that gutter people. Even in our poorest neighborhoods, they think they're being cool. Young suburban Muslim kid, what up my nigga? And GD this and SH that because they hear it on some record recording. And they think this is cool and this is being ghetto. That's not ghetto. Ask anyone who was raised in a real ghetto, not a Hollywood ghetto, a real ghetto, about how hard their mothers, in many cases, and sometimes the mothers and their fathers strove to keep them away from that language, strove to keep them neat and presentable, cut their hair themselves, bought a $10 set of clippers because they couldn't afford clippers to keep their hair neat and clean. Dress them neatly before they sent them out to school. Wash their mouths out with soap if they ever used any of that language. That's not ghetto, that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood's exploitation of the most degenerate and abused and oppressed elements in our society to profit off of. And it's a pathetic, sad situation when Muslims are following what Hollywood has put out to follow. If you want to be ghetto, you go down to some of these churches and listen to what's being taught. If you want to be ghetto, you go to a home where a mother or a father are struggling on a shoestring budget to make sure their children are neat and clean. And if they come home with a tattoo or with their pants hanging off their rear end, they face a severe punishment. That's ghetto. So if you want to be ghetto, go down to the right ghetto, the real ghetto and not the Hollywood ghetto. And you'll come back with some dignity. You'll come back with your head hanging, standing tall. You come back with a sense of appreciation for the blessings that you have. You didn't grow up in roach infested, rat infested dwellings. So don't act like that's your upbringing. You didn't have to sleep on a 20 year old mattress that's been rotted out. And the springs digging into your skin don't act like that's your existence. Be a, a leader, be a, an embodiment of virtue like Ibrahim. Ummah is also imam, a leader. Be a leader for people. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama. Make us leaders for the righteous. And that should be a sincere prayer that we make. To be leaders. A qudwa. Imam ummah is a qudwa, an example to be followed.
We should strive to be followed, not following the most degenerate examples that are out there. We should be an example of dignity, an example of virtue, an example of courage. That is the Muslim. That is you, brothers and sisters. That is us, brothers and sisters. An imam, a, a, a moral exemplar. In the Ibrahim an imam, a leader for the people, and a guide, and an imam is a had. had, and a guide for all peoples. That is the role of the Muslim in this world. That is the role of the Muslim. And Ibrahim السلام, in some opinions is the one who has given us. This name, huwa sammakumul muslimina. Fi min qablu wa fi hadha. He has named you Muslim. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Some interpretations Allah Ta'ala. But for our purposes, let's work with Ibrahim. Brothers and sisters, don't let him down. And in conclusion... Said, I said that before. This time I'll put the notes away. You know I mean it. In conclusion, reflect on another thing related from the life of Ibrahim. Ibrahim السلام, found himself before a tyrant, Nimruv or Nimrod. And that tyrant hated Islam. And we find ourselves faced with tyrannical parties and individuals in our country. Not the majority of the people, but there are groups and there are individuals who are tyrannical and they hate Islam. And that tyrant threw Ibrahim السلام, in the fire. And when Ibrahim السلام, was thrown in the fire, he said something. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us, Qalaha Ibrahimu hina hina nar. Ibrahim said it when he was flung into the hellfire. What did he say? Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Allah suffices us what an excellent one to trust in. So brothers and sisters, as we find ourselves before these forces, these pernicious and diabolical forces that would have Islam eradicated from this country, that would have Muslims expelled from this country, that are inciting hatred against Muslims, against Islam, against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us say as Ibrahim said, let us say as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it was said to him inna al-nas qad jam'u lakum faqala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hasbunallahu wa ni'am al-wakil and Allah Ta'ala records in the Quran alladhina qala lahum an-nas inna al-nas qad jam'u lakum fakhshawhum faqalu hasbunallahu wa ni'am al-wakil those whom it was said to, the people are gathering against you, fear them. And there are those who are saying to the Muslim, the people are gathering against you. The host, they're gathering against you. All of these various elements we can name, but you know their names all too well, are gathering against you. فَزَادَهُمْ imana. It only increased their faith. وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ And they said, Allah suffices us. What an excellent one to trust in. Why did it increase their faith? Because they saw miracles unfold. Just as Ibrahim السلام, he saw the fire become cool. And he saw himself enveloped in peace and well-being. وَسَلَامَ عَلَى Ibrahim. And we see miracles unfolding. But we are not cognizant in many instances. To give you a small example, the forces and the momentum was gathering against the Muslims. 
pointing people towards the dreadful day when this individual whose name does not deserve mention is going to have his infamous Quran burning. And the climate is against the Muslim. The radio, the television, the media against the Muslim. And then what happens? No Qurans are burnt. Rather, the entire nation rallies behind the Muslims. And from coast to coast, they're having Quran readings in the synagogue, in the church, in the parks, on the highways, the byways. Is that not true? Many of us participated in those. Is that not a miracle? Allah Ta'ala is in control. And when we realize Allah Ta'ala is in control, we can look at the events and our faith is strengthened. And we can say with due faith, due sincerity, due conviction, Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Allah suffices us. What an excellent one to trust in. Ibrahim alayhi salam said it. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. Brothers and sisters, let us say it. And let us, let us mean it. Let us believe it. And let us live that reality. Hasbunallahu fa ni'mal wakil. Ni'mal mawla. Wa ni'mal nasir. Ghufranaka rabbana. Wa ilayka al masir. Allahum subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salaman ala al mursaleen. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر 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 brothers and sisters may Allah Taala bless you bless your families as you enjoy the blessings be bestowed upon you of shelter, of food, of drink, think of those less fortunate. Not only those Muslims less fortunate, those who've been pushed by, pushed out of their home by both man-made and natural disasters in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in many other places, Kashmir, many other places, in Sudan. Also think of the our brothers and sisters in humanity in places like Haiti, the poorest of us will be wealthy in that society. If we live in a homeless shelter, we turn the faucet on in the homeless shelter, clean water comes out of the tap. We're not forced to drink cholera, typhoid infested waters. Allahu Akbar. Think of the less fortunate. And we don't say this to make anyone guilty. We say this to encourage us to remember the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us and to give shukr for those blessings, to give thanks, thankfulness, thanks for those blessings. And our thankfulness is to work to extend them to others, to work to the best of our ability and circumstance to extend them to others. And may Allah ta'ala bless all of us to do something meaningful to extend those blessings to others. Brothers and sisters, may Allah Ta'ala bless you, may He bless your families, may He bless this masjid, may He bless, make this a center that's alive, that the, the believers are constantly coming into and out of for various righteous purposes in all of the centers, all of the masajid, may that be the case. May Allah Ta'ala, we mentioned the immigrants and the converts, may Allah Ta'ala bless us to build strong bridges, and relationships between those two groups because only when those two groups are brought together will Islam fulfill its destiny in this land. Only then will Islam be a powerful force of good and virtue. When those forces come together, may Allah Ta'ala bless us to work to bring those forces together. Allahumma ufir lil muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat الأحياء منهم والأموات ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا 
وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا أفرض علينا الصبر واثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا أفرض علينا الصبر واثبت أقدامنا وتوثنا مسلمين وعفو عنا ووفي لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تعول به بيننا وبين معصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنة ومن اليقين ما يهون علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا بأسماءنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عدانا ولا تجعل مصعبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافنا ولا يخل من لا يخافك ولا يرحمنا يا أحم الراحمين وعفو عنا وعفو لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين الله منصر المسلمين في كل مكان الله منصر المسلمين في كل زمان الله منصر إخواننا المسلمين في فلسطين وفي العراق وفي كشمير وفي أفغانستان وفي باكستان وفي السودان وفي الشيشان وفي السومال وفي العراق وفي في الجزائر وفي كل مكان يا الله الله منصرنا في هذا البلد الله منصرنا في هذا البلد الله منصرنا في هذا البلد اللهم من أراد خيرا لهذه المحم لهذه الأمة المحمدية فوثقوا إلا كل خير ومن أراد شرا لها وللمسلمين فخذه أخذ عزيز مقتدر اللهم اجعل تدبيرهم تدميرهم اللهم عليك بعداء الإسلام أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم انصرنا اللهم انصرنا اللهم انصرنا اللهم بارك لنا وارحمنا واعف عنا واجعلنا من المتقين والحكنا بالصالحين واجعلنا من من المتقين من الصابرين من الذين يعملون ليلا ونهارا لخدمة هذا الدين هذا الدين واعف عنا واوفي لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتاء ذي الكربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين وكونوا مع الصادقين وكونوا مع الصادقين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد كل عام وأنتم بخير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته